And then they uh, both carrying AK-47s, and they just pushed me back against a wall and stood back. And uh, at this stage, I thought they were going to shoot me. Um, but to me, I wasn't scared. I thought one bullet, and that was the end of it. I'd left my family, uh, good kids, and a lovely wife, and uh, I realised that they could perhaps look after themselves. They were strong. The knock came at the door, um, the family's officer, and the colonel's wife at the time were both stood there and said that there'd been an accident. So they came indoors and said that Mick had been in an explosion. In but at the end of the day, when there is one human being on the end of a stick laying into you, it does come as a shock. He wasn't killed as a soldier. He was just, he was murdered. In war throughout this century, the British have been winners. In 1918, the people celebrated victory over Germany. But the cost of winning had been the loss of one million dead and two million wounded. At the other end of the century, in a much more muted affair, Britain's armed services marched again in victory through the streets of London. In June 1991, they celebrated their sweeping victory in the Gulf. The Iraqis had paid for defeat in tens of thousands of lives. But, as always in war, even among the victors, there were those who lost. Target somewhere by Barnard Castle. Okay. Let's have a look so, at the exams. Excuse John. Looks Flight good. Lieutenant really Robbie Stewart is a navigator in a tornado jet. This. Today he's planning a route to the Lake District. In 1991, his maps were of Iraq. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, Robbie Stewart, for the first time in his life, was called to war. Um, I told my family and I got them to come down straight away because I wanted them to be with me just for those two nights. Could have been my last two nights with them. My family is very important to me. In fact, it made me slightly stronger being married with two children. So at least I made my mark in life and I had my kids. It was my duty at that stage. I realised I had to go. I'd taken the Queen's shilling, so to speak. I was going. So it was a horrendous time, awful time for me and my family. And I knew at that stage there would be war. There was no doubt about it. And my wife we just couldn't take it in. I remember she walked around the living room saying, no, no. And I really felt sick. OK, the fuel is uh, 17 80, it's in balance. Instruments? Instruments, all the ropes, heavy eye, and uh, 1013, some at the moment. That's set at the back. That out. And now, plug set to zero. One three, you've got 45. Two out of. By January 1991, Robbie Stewart was part of 20 British squadrons in Saudi Arabia preparing to fight. Headlines this evening, President Bush says the Allied forces are ready now to attack Iraq. He agreed with John Major that there's nothing to negotiate with Saddam Hussein. And then one morning we were taken in and explained, OK, tonight we're going to war. We felt very sick, you know, sort of peculiar feeling in the pit of his stomach. ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. We went 
through onto our sortie that day. And uh, we, we were scared, there's no doubt about it. And we got airborne, it was absolutely pitch black, you couldn't see a thing. And we were sitting there, once again, at 480 knots, and the only thing that told us what height we were at was the TV monitor that said 200 feet. And as we rushed in, we didn't get any RWR, that's radar warning information, telling us that there was anything looking at us, until, just as we approached the target, there was a quick bleep on radar, and Dave said to me... Um, this is your pilot. That's right, Dave Warnington. We got something on radar on the nose, Robbie, and the next minute there was a huge whoosh, well, we could see it, the light coming up, the missile. And so Dave took control, it was on autopilot, remember, at this stage, and he tried to turn away, and there was about two seconds um, flight time of this missile. Uh, there was a huge explosion, and that's really all I can remember, apart from the ejection. <laughs> You can just remember the huge explosion in your back. And that's all I can remember. I came to the next morning. Initially, I didn't realize, but uh, very shortly afterwards, I, I looked down and saw my leg was uh, covered in blood, and I realized my, my leg was broken. I thought at the time my bone had gone through the leg because there was so much blood. Um, my shoulder was pretty sore and back, of course, from the ejection, but I wasn't sure what else had gone wrong at that stage. My first thought was, I'm alive. My second thought was, I'm the only person who knows I'm alive. And then my immediate thoughts went to my family, my wife, and I thought, they don't know I'm here. And uh, that struck home very badly. And in fact, I did actually shed a few tears at that stage. But one thing that struck me then and later on was that I was alive and I was going to get back whatever and that was going to be a great uh, surprise to her. If Saddam Hussein wants to avoid a land battle, he knows what he must do. He has to withdraw unconditionally and immediately from Kuwait until and unless he does that, the conflict will continue. Miles behind enemy lines, Robbie Stewart was picked up by the Iraqis where he lay in the desert. He was taken to the local army headquarters. I was in a lot of pain. I was probably coming out of shock to a certain degree, but uh, I distinctly remember I was, I was vomiting most of the time with the pain, and I was dragged across the ground with a, a broken leg, and uh, that was pretty bad. And then I was put on a stretcher, and I realized it was an interrogation center because I could then hear somebody being interrogated in front of me. And that was the first time, really, I had real deep fear because uh, this was it, you know, interrogation and all the stories, perhaps, would come true that you'd heard and I was taken into uh, an area and interrogated. You know, we can only say the big four. So I started off and uh, answered his questions in, in this manner. And the big four being name? Name, rank, number, date of birth. And uh, he said, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Stewart, you're not answering our questions. One thing he did say, though, he said, we've got your pilot, Waddington, and that was a great relief to me. I realized Dave was alive. And he took me in and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Stewart, it's not good enough. And uh, he went away and came back with a bloke who had a rather large stick, who then proceeded to hit me with this. Where were the blows directed? Mainly about my body, but um, just, just over my body, really. Not at the leg? Well, yes, they, uh, they directed some at the leg and said they were going to break the other leg. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't. You're painting a picture of men beating a badly injured man who's been vomiting with the pain, who's just coming out of shock. Is that what was happening? Yes, yes, that's what was happening at that stage. But of course, to me, it wasn't so bad in the sense that I was in deep shock. So I was, uh, I was at one level of pain, you could say. I realized I had to do something. And I gave him a story I'd seen in the Sunday Times. And I just quoted it. I don't know how and why I thought of it. It just came to me just like that. And I just quoted it verbatim. And I felt good about it because it had been in the papers and anybody could buy the papers. And after I'd related this story to him, um, what I was doing, I was in a tornado carrying JP233. In fact, I wasn't. And he didn't ask one question I was scared to answer. I didn't feel I was giving anything away. And he was happy in the end and uh, he let me go, and they, I was taken to a hospital. Allied 
generals were describing the war in the Gulf as a tremendous success. The commander of the US Marines said the war would be over in days, not weeks. At his air base in Saudi Arabia, tornado pilot Simon Burgess was still waiting to fly his first mission. Uh, we're all sat watching uh, the news, as, as we did when we weren't at work, constant watching the news. And uh, the news came that uh, they had some POWs and they're on TV, and the clips were shown on TV of, uh, of the British and a couple of American POWs. What do you think of this war against Iraq? I think this war should be stopped so we can go home. I do not agree on this war with Iraq. Everybody was furious, absolutely outraged. How you have been shut down? Right, let me It wasn't a case of, ooh, I don't really want to do it anymore. It was a case of, right, let me get airborne now. <laughs> Everyone was furious that this had been done to, uh, to our guys. And seeing them on TV really brought it home. Day seven of the war, we got airborne. I've got 11 miles to target. Yeah, that checks. Fairly calm at this stage, it started to point towards the border. The border was complete blackness. Over Iraq was complete blackness, uh, apart from a few stars above. As we got towards the target, it started to get light. Radar's on, correcting slightly left as well. Okay, I've got it. It's a good mark. Seven miles. When it switches live. There was a lot of double checking and triple checking of switches because we'd have been very annoyed having got to that stage to have not dropped the weapons um, through one of our own mistakes. One second. Oh, One's gone. Get to the target and uh, release the weapons. We entered the turn and uh, there's a very, very large explosion behind us. And instantly, uh, my, my first recollection is everything was orange. Uh, the cockpit was lit by orange, and uh, I could see the outside of the aeroplane was orange. Jump on the tank, jump on the tank, jump on the tank, right? OK. One of the bombs had exploded prematurely. Um, one of the fuses had uh, told the bomb to go off early and uh, that's exactly what had happened. The bomb was about 120 feet away from the aeroplane uh, and, it, and it fused. It's burning in the wind now. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it. We're going to have to go. I was very keen to stay with the aeroplane as long as I could and, and get it as close to friendly territory as possible. Uh, then I had an avalanche of, of warnings come on and it was a case of, well, we're going to have to leave the aeroplane. I looked over to where I figured my navigator, Bob, landed, and I saw a lot of vehicle headlights and heard shouting. I thought, well, that's, that's Bob caught. So I dug a hole in the desert, sort of a, a coffin-shaped hole, and just lay there and started squeaking on my radio, people to come and get me. And how long did you lie there? About two hours. And then what happened? A jeep stumbled across me. Uh, there, there were a lot of jeeps driving erratically around the desert, in no particular direction, and I figured they had to be looking for me, because they would have found my parachute that was left behind. I didn't have time to, to conceal. And uh, this one particular jeep suddenly stood on its ear and made a beeline for me. I thought, I guess I've just been seen. British guns firing. The Royal Artillery joining again with Allied guns all along the front line. The gun detachments have trained for weeks in this desert. Now they're very much part of increased pressure on the Iraqis. Fire! Baghdad, 350 miles from the front line, was by now badly damaged by Allied air attacks. Simon Burgess was brought to the Iraqi capital for interrogation. There was quite a bit of beating, um, which is one form of interrogating people. Um, With warning, you knew it was coming, you were blindfolded, so... Yeah, I mean, I provoked it <laughs> by not talking. It's going to happen. Yeah. 
what sort of a question would you be asked and what would be your reaction and what would be the reaction to your answer? What sort of aeroplane do you fly? Um, can't answer that question. Where were you based in Saudi? Can't answer that question. They're very, they're low level questions, and what very low key questions. And what was the reaction to your replies? Well, it was uh, okay. So they'd ask another question, and I wouldn't answer it, and they'd say, okay. And then eventually he said, look, uh, you know, Burgess, you're not helping us. Uh, we'll give you one more chance to answer a question. And he asked me a question, and this is it. I said, I can't answer that question. Then he said, uh, okay. And I heard him walk away. And I was knelt down on the floor thinking, it's going to come. And then and more footsteps came back, which may have been him, may have been someone else. And uh, then the, the beating started. Where and with what? Legs and uh, felt like a cricket bat. Flat plank with a, uh, a fairly hard edge as well, a fairly narrow edge as well. Almost inconceivable for, uh, for us to um, imagine the, uh, the shock and the misery of that. Mm. Yeah. And no matter how well trained you, you, you are, surely it's a, sh it's a shock to you as well, isn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, it, it, I was certain that it was going to happen. Absolutely certain. There's no doubt about it. Um, but at the end of the day, when there is one human being on the end of a stick laying into you, it does come as a shock. Yeah. And the pain is obviously a factor as well. Does your mind race over options of telling them things that aren't true that with luck they'll believe? This is all stuff that uh, we are actually trained in. And the pros and cons of each option that's available to you. The RAF has one particular option that it advocates. And in fact, to stray from that option, you are straying from the official secret sect. Uh, one of the reasons that I didn't talk was that I thought, I'm not going to let my friends down. They're here, they're not talking. Or even if they are, well, I'm not going to. And that kept me going. As the land war started, Iraqi casualties were already estimated at 30,000. The Allies were counting theirs in dozens. All units, say the Allies, are at least 12 hours ahead of the schedule set for them forces pouring through the breaches in the enemy front lines. Three quarters of a century earlier, both the winners and the losers were counting their dead in millions. The dead we buried behind the lines at night well, you'd have to put three or four of them in the shell hole. Well, it was a smell, I can still smell it now, all these years after. The smell of putrefying flesh. Whenever you went near the front line, that smell was always there. Because if you buried your comrades, and there was a bit, there was a, a shelling, the next morning or the next day, they were disinterred. And so it went on forever and ever. This was absolutely terrific, horrible, horror. In such conditions, some men were unable to carry on and they ran away. Others simply refused to obey orders which they believed meant certain death. During the course of the First World War, more than 3,000 were found guilty of such offences. Of those, 307 were executed. The majority were shot for desertion and cowardice. Other offences included mutiny, disobedience, sleeping on duty and throwing away a rifle. When we were behind the lines, every now and again, the battalion would be paraded and the adjutant would read out a case like that, the private or lieutenant or sergeant, somebody had been picked up, court-martialed, and uh, found guilty of cowardice in face of the enemy, sentenced to be shot at dawn. 
the sentence was duly carried out. While the names of those executed were read out to the men at the front, their families were merely told they had died of wounds. Many of their names, therefore, were included on local war memorials. In Sutton in Ashfield, for example, the memorial bears the names of two of the McCubbins family, Father William and his young son, Bertie. In early August 1916, news of Bertie reached his mother. There was a telegram, killed by gunfire. And a uh, grandmother thought he'd been killed like a lot of others, you know, in action. After the war was over, a young man who was in the same regiment came back and called on grandmother and told her that Bertie had been shot. Bert and a lot of the others had refused to uh, obey an order or go over the top or something like that. And uh, they picked two men at random and Bertie was one of them and shot him. Emily Ann McCubbin's husband, William, had also died in the war. The truth about her son, Bertie, now sent her insane. She locked herself in the room and wouldn't come out for anybody. And she written, wrote letters to Lloyd George, who was then Prime Minister, and anyone else who would listen to her, given of her thoughts as to what they had done to her son. In the first week of July 1916, Bertie McCubbin was court-martialed near the French village of Festubert. His submission to the court read, I have always tried to play my part while I have been in the army. I have a father somewhere in France, leaving my mother at home with six children. I'm always thinking that if anything happened to us, what would become of them? If you deal leniently with me, I will try and do my bit and keep up a good reputation. In the sound archive of the Imperial War Museum, there is an eyewitness account of an execution on the Western Front. Two men came and led him out of the hut where he'd been on guarded all night. As he left the hut, his legs gave way. Then one could see the, see the fear entering his heart. Rather than march to the firing spot, he was dragged along. When we got there, he was had his hands tied behind his back, he was put up against a wall, his eyes were bandaged, and the firing squad were given the order to fire, but he fell to the ground, writhing. But at that moment, the sergeant in charge stepped forward, put a revolver to his head, and blew his brains out. At five o'clock on the morning of July the 30th, Bertie McCubbin was shot. it was recorded that his death was not instantaneous. I think it was a friend, a lady friend, came and asked her to go to the church with her. And uh, she uh, thought she saw Uncle Bert during one of these sessions with the uh, spiritualists that, and he was holding um, lilies of the valley and after that she seemed more settled in her mind. The military cemetery at Browns Road is one of dozens in this part of France. Less than five miles from where he was killed, Bertie lies in plot five, row B, grave 16. I've never seen the cemetery, but I could just imagine rows and rows of just white crosses, nobody visiting. He could even be buried next to the fellow that shot him. 
He should be back with his own folk. He, he was a soldier, I know, but he didn't, he wasn't killed as a soldier. He was just, he was murdered. But he wasn't a coward. No McCubbins are cowards. By the middle of February, Baghdad had endured nearly four weeks of air attacks. Robbie Stewart had been moved from hospital to the same top security prison as the other POWs. I was taken out for interrogation from time to time. Um, I was taken out... Uh, one thing they did at one stage was take me to a doctor and ask me if I was all right. And um, I remember the inspection was very quick and cursory. In fact, what they did was they just pulled my underpants open. They were just checking to see if I was, I'd been circumcised, see if I was Jewish. <laughs> but fortunately for me, I, I wasn't. And then uh, I was taken back to my cell. They tried to make me do a video early on, but I felt I couldn't do that. So I refused to do it. And uh, the guy who was doing the interview said, right, Mr. Stewart, you'll do it tomorrow. And all night I waited, and I expect them to come, because he indicated, he said, you'll do it tomorrow. But uh, he didn't, and I was quite surprised. One night, the prison we were in was actually bombed. And a uh, very, very frightening night. The prison was hit on the, the night of the 24th, probably by 2,000 pounders. And you could just hear the bombs flying through the air for about three or four seconds before they impacted. Something I hadn't appreciated about bombs is they actually crackle on their way and you can hear them crackling. Somebody shouted, incoming. Um, I thought, what? <laughs> and the whole building shook wildly. The ceiling came down and we had these little slats in the doors which were uh, steel slats held on by this great big um, lever arm. It was about a quarter of an inch overlap of steel. These were blown inwards. You can imagine the blast from that. It felt like it was in my cell. It obviously wasn't. Um, then that, that distorted my door, as I found out the next morning. My door was, was actually bowed. Uh, did a lot of damage to the roof. There was no plaster left on the roof. There was a little low wall in the cell, which was partly knocked down. Outside the prison, hundreds of civilians had by now been killed, hundreds more injured. The people of Baghdad were in despair. After about half an hour, then the guards came back up and they had to break open the doors because uh, they couldn't find the keys. The small guard, he, he put me on his shoulder because, of course, I couldn't walk. And he took me down uh, and then he dragged me along the concrete with another bloke. And he said, look, this is what your American friends have done, which was this big bunker that had been destroyed. <laughs> and then they uh, both carrying AK-47s, and they just pushed me back against the wall and stood back. And uh, at this stage, I thought they were going to shoot me. Um, but to me, I wasn't scared. I thought one bullet, and that was the end of it. I'd left my family, uh, good kids and a lovely wife, and uh, I realised that they could perhaps look after themselves. They were strong, and uh, that's what kept me going at that point. Why I lose my wife and my children? Is that fair? Nobody, else, nobody says something to stop this massacre. The families of the dead are always the losers in war, whether they belong to the victors or the vanquished.